Good morning, everybody. Excuse me. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Public Infrastructure, Environment, and Sustainability Committee for April 26th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from March 22nd? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Go ahead. Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? Minutes are approved. And first up on uh, council requests is an update from Mike Piccolo on the Spokane Regional Transportation Council interlocal agreement that's been under negotiation. Okay. Thank you, Council President. So the <clears throat> SRTC board has put together a working group consist of their board members and all the attorneys for the main agencies participating. The last time we reviewed the interlocal agreement was in 2013. So it's time for time for review. Uh, the main impetus to do this review at this time was a change in state law that requires entities such as SRTC to offer voting board positions to federally recognized tribes that have land within the boundaries of, in this case, SRTC. And we have two such uh, tribal organizations, the Spokane and the Kalispell tribes, both would qualify. So initially, this group came together to figure out how best to amend the interlocal agreement to meet that requirement. I believe there was an August 1st deadline to have this in place. So the goal was to get the interlocal agreement revised, approved by all the parties, and to get those two tribal governmental agencies on board before the August 1st deadline. So the goal here is to get this approved by the agencies by the end of May. So we have the final two months to sit down with the two tribes and negotiate any further details. The, uh, and so, so the interlocal agreement does just that. It provides a full voting membership to each tribal agency. So there'll be two more board positions they each have their own individual board appointment position. Uh, the second ch main change is with the increase of board membership. Over the past seven years, we've seen population increase for a number of the cities. So Spokane Valley has transitioned from over 100,000 population. So they go from one board position to two. We have the two tribal positions. And then we have three of the, of the smaller cities, Millwood, Medical Lake, and Deer Park that have also gone high enough where they get one voting position. The five uh, much smaller cities remain one position amongst those five cities. And there's also a dedicated position for a rail industry rep. So that brings the membership from 14 to 21. I think the board recognizes it's a large number, but they're prepared to deal with it. Uh, there were also a number of housekeeping changes, mainly cleaning up references to federal law, state law, getting rid of unnecessary language, making sure the, the citations are correct, making a number of other housekeeping changes. Uh, there was another a lot of discussion about maintaining the weighted voting provision that SRTC has had for some time, so the membership can vote by individual positions, which would be 21, or upon request, they can go to a weighted voting method for certain uh, motions and uh, actions. And that has been maintained. So at this point, uh, Kevin Wallace, the executive director of SRTC, will send out the uh, final version, which you, you have with a cover letter. He'll send that to all the mayors and city council members for all the participating cities and towns with the request that this be approved by the end of May so we can, so SRTC can then go back to the two tribal members and negotiate any further details they would need. And that would be done uh, through a, an MOU or a letter of understanding. And Council President Beggs and Council Member Lori Kinnear have been attending uh, these work group sessions. I think we had both of you, at, you know, one of you at, at, at all of the meetings. That was, that was very helpful. Yeah. Um, I was at most of the meetings and 
I did want to just comment about the weighted voting. I wasn't particularly excited about that, and it's never been used before, but um, Spokane County felt strongly that they were worried that all the smaller cities could gang up on Spokane and Spokane Valley and the county, and so they wanted to preserve that ability. Uh, again, it's never been used, and my take, even I'm not a board member of SRTC, that's Councilmember Mum and Kinnear, and Councilmember Burke has been on it in the past. Uh, it's, it's more of a consensus type of organization as opposed to these strict votes in my experience with them. And um, I was really happy that um, we got past the initial resistance to having the tribes uh, join. And I think it'll be a richer um, transportation system with their voices at the table. So I, I think it's worth approving once it comes to us. But that's just my comment, and I'll turn it over to any other council members who might have comments. Council Member Mum. I just was, uh, and, and Council President and I discussed this, I was a little curious how they came up with the weighting. It, uh, it's very difficult to do with a large group like that. Uh, we have a, somewhat of that happening at Spokane Transit Authority now because it's more representational based on population. This is a really tough, uh, large board to try to get waiting, you know, kids start to get into fractions and that sort of thing. So I don't know if there is actually, if we're actually achieving the goal that the, the group wanted to, to have it weighted, they've added another vote to Spokane Valley, which means the city of Spokane Valley and the city of Spokane have equal weighting, even though we have more than twice the population. So I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying it's difficult to do. And I'm I do think it's rare when it's used and, and maybe never it will be. But if anyone has any other information on how they came up with the weighting, that might be important for the public to know. Uh, my understanding from the meetings where I was at is simply Kevin Wallace came up with the proposal after listening to the uh, representatives from each of the ILA signatories. Um, there wasn't a lot of debate about it. I think partly because, again, it's never been used. But I, I agree with you. I just, I didn't even think we should have it. But <laughs> well, Mr. Piccolo, do you have any other information that helps us understand how the weighting was chosen? Well, I think Kevin Wallace looked at some other examples from around the state, and he really tried to to manage this so it was reasonably rep representative. So we have 21 members, and then he double that number for the weighted vote. Uh, Spokane, Spokane County, and the Valley all have the same percentage. We get 3.5% per member. Uh, so you try to keep that even. And you also try to factor in the fact that to approve this, you need to have the county approve and 60% of the cities representing 75% of the population. So we tried to work that equation in as well, as best he could. And this was what came up with that he thought was a fair representation of those figures. It was, it was a little, you know, trying to be a little bit creative and recognizing that it, ha uh, it has never been used and, and hopefully will not have to be used. And it can only be used for, for motions. It cannot be used for uh, adopting bylaws or rules, for approving the budget, or for hiring and discharging the executive director. So those three decisions, you cannot use weighted voting on those. Thank you, that helps. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, what, just what happens if we vote no, if the other entities approve it, but we, we do not? Yeah. Then the, they would look at whether or not those entities approving it constitute 60% of the cities making up 75% of the population, which I think without the city of Spokane probably would not happen. When you look at the total population, the city has enough where if we don't approve it, it doesn't go forward. And there may be true if Spokane Valley doesn't approve. So you have to have, 60, you have, to have Spokane County plus 60% of the cities, and those cities have to make up 75% of the population. So if we don't approve it, uh, the rest of the parties might come back and just go forward on their own. That would be pretty difficult to do with the city being such a large jurisdiction within the SRTC. I don't know how they could do that. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions, comments? Okay, so thanks, Mike, for um, sure. translating that for us. And uh, we'll wait for the official call to action from uh, Interim Director Wallace, and then we'll bring it forward uh, for uh, consideration of approval by the full council. So. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, I think we're gonna hear from Raylene on the CSO program and next level of treatment. Thank you, Council President and Council Members. Um, let's see, see if I can share this here. Are you seeing that? Not yet. Now it's loading. Yep, we can see it. All right, perfect. Um, so we'll talk about our CSO program and NLT and how far we've come. Um, as I discuss this, uh, our CSO program and NLT, I would like you to keep this beautiful resource um, that we have in our backyard in mind on the importance of these programs. We look back in time, um, everything going to the river, I watched a documentary on that park and they were talking about a nice grassy area next to the river and the fact that they were worried that the public wouldn't use it for picnicking it with their families. Um, and I was like, what? And uh, it was due to the fact that there was so much sewage and floating debris in the river um, that they were afraid they didn't want to use it. Um, well, we've come a long ways from that. Um, 1958, we got our treatment plant in place. In 1972, we had 44 outfalls. 1980, um, with the stormwater separation, we got it down to 24 outfalls. In 2014, we're at 20 outfalls. And then in 2020, we got it down to 18 outfalls. This bar graph uh, kind of showing that same stuff here. Um, in 72, with the 42 outfalls, there were almost a thousand events at about 725 million gallons a year going to the river. Um, in the 80s with that stormwater separation, um, we were able to, to cut that dramatically uh, to 24 outfalls, about 450 events and with about 100 million gallons going to the river. As indicated in the, in the graphs, um, we continue to reduce our events and volumes in 2014, 18 and 20. This, this represents the blue bars are the volumes in million gallons per year and the orange bars or the orange line is the number of events. And this shows the continued reduction of events and amounts of untreated wastewater entering the river. This graph is showing the number of events compared to the precipitation um, for yearly from 2003 to 2020. If we focus in on the last five years though with the average and above average rainfall the continued reduction in the events year after year are shown here. And this graph is for the volume that overflowed compared to um, the yearly rainfall. And again, if we focus in on that last five years, the reduction of million gallons of untreated wastewater into the river. Um, in 2016, there was about 80 million gallons that went to the river. Compare, compare that to 2020 when we had about 13.5 million gallons that went to the river. Continued improvement every year. This graph is just shown last year. Um, I think it rained almost every day in May, uh, one of the wildest on record. Note though that we didn't have any overflows after July. And then in August, CSO 26 facility, which is the, what was one of our frequent flyers, um, finally came online and that's the one that's next to City Hall. And there was no, uh, no overflows after that. I want to kind of give you a, just a basic 101 on design of a CSO tank. Um, so during dry weather and the orange pipe there is, is the, how the flow is con conveyed to the treatment plant. Um, if a storm event fills, it starts filling the pipe, it starts filling up these tanks. Um, this would be what would be the flush chamber. Here's the flush gate. Here's a weir kind of going through. This is the flush way of a, of a, of a tank. You have your sump down at the lower end. You'll have the discharge gate. 
and the discharge pipe. So if the storm event subsides, um, it's going to start putting it right back into the um, system and send it down to the treatment plant to be treated. If the, if the tank gets completely filled, then that's when it would finally overflow to, to the um, river. Um, the main takeaway with this is the amount of storage. The old regulators were all within the same manhole, uh, so the overflow to the river was almost instantaneous. Um, where with these facilities, we have anywhere from a few thousand gallons of storage to 2.2 million gallons of storage before it ever goes to the river. This is give you a little perspective. This is me standing under below the pipe um, that will carry the flows inside the inside the CSO 26 facility. Um, this facility uh, can handle about 2.1 million gallons, and I really think I could walk up that pipe. <laughs> <laughs> um, the tanks and regulators. Let's give you a little bit on that. Uh, we have 30 CSO regulators, tanks, and interceptor protection tanks. Of these, seven of the tanks have pump stations in them to pump the flows, uh, the, the, uh, the water out back out and put it back into the system. We have 18 outfalls. We're hoping that we can remove one of these outfalls, one, one more this year. Um, we've got about 15 million gallons of storage capacity. We've got 2.6 million gallons of um, interceptor protection storage capacity. We also have two stormwater tanks, which is fairly new, um, and both of those have um, pump stations in them. To give you some fun facts here, um, between 2018 and 20, um, when most of the tanks came online, CSO overflows have been reduced by 41 events to 50% year over year, and the volumes have also decreased by 27 million gallons to 55% year over year. Um, as of December 31st, 2020, 15 of the 19 sites are meeting their annual overflow frequency performance standards. Adjustments will be made um, to bring these three sites into compliance, and that fourth site um, is the CSO 26 site, which um, we believe will be compliant in 2021. Um, and now that the CSO and the NLT construction projects are wrapping up, we'll continue monitoring the performances and ensure they're meeting the permit requirements and we'll work with integrated capital and engineering to find solutions or continue to tweak and optimize the systems. There's a few more fun facts for you. The CSO storage um, during storm events has outpaced the, the CSO overflow since third quarter of 19. 2020 had the lowest number of CSO in count and volume since we started tracking in, in 03. Uh, 2020 had 23 overflows. Uh, Ten of those were from our frequent flyer, number CSO 26, um, and this total of 13.5 million gallons um, with the annual rainfall of 16.35. We didn't have any overflows in the last five months of 2020. Now let's talk about uh, the Riverside Water Reclamation Facility and Next Level of Treatment, or NLT. This here, the yellow line is representing uh, how the flows are coming in and working through the plant. It comes in through into the headworks area, goes to, into primary clarifiers. The two northern um, facilities up there are the biosolids processing and the um, digesters. Uh, then we got the aeration basins, secondary clarifiers, and disinfection. And the new membrane facility is the, is going to be is down there on the lower left there. Um, this is just kind of giving you an overview. The blue and yellow areas are projects that were done 2002 to 15. These projects range from covering uh, the primary clarifiers, doing some odor control, converting secondary clarifiers to handle storm flows, and building the egg and silo digesters, as well as some habitat conservation. The green areas um, identified here are the more current projects worked on in the last five years or so uh, to facilitate those flows for the, for the NLT. We had to add a primary clarifier, we had to redo the chemical storage, do modifications in the aeration basin, upgrade the SCADA system um, before we were able to build the membrane facility. You might be asking why. Um, there's a TMDL for dissolved oxygen, um, which is in our NPDES waste discharge permit that's issued by Ecology. Um, it's a, a TMDL is a, is a similar capacity for the Spokane River and Long Lake. Um, and our permit is requiring 17.8 uh, pounds a day going to the river. Last year, the permit require, requirement allowed us up to 157 pounds a day. Um, so 
Um, with 30 million gallons of secondary treatment, we were putting approximately seven, 75 pounds a day in, meeting below the, uh, the allow, allowable. Um, starting March 1st, 2021, the permit required the discharge to meet that 17.8. So with next level of treatment at 30 million gallons um, a day, will be a, when it gets up fully running, uh, two pounds a day is what we'll be putting in. And this will be through the critical season for um, phosphorus is March 1st through the 31st. And it's all based on the seasonal average. How and why did we choose these systems? This, this photo here is, is uh, um, when we we're doing some pilot projects, uh, we identified early on that we had to improve our effluent um, to the river. And we ran initial pilot projects that had six different uh, technologies from 2009 to 11 to help us inform on the best technology that would work in our area. Um, and, and when we did, we then did um, do a side-by-side -side pilot in 2015 and 16. Ten years of piloting was crucial, I believe, to this success. We did single-stage um, tertiary treatment versus dual-stage. Um, we did capacity-related um, issues for to be able to get the net environmental benefit. Uh, we reduction in flocculation basins and chemical dosing. Uh, certain. Uh, Deferring the additional solid processing capacities, uh, certainty, certainty to the design and compliance, and we believe that piloting saved us 20 to 50 million dollars, irrespective of which system we, we put in. Um, these are the two different membranes that we did um, the side by side with the plant flows going through them. Um, the goal was to inform the operating staff and city decision makers on maintenance and repair procedures. Um, it helped answer and understand what we were getting ourselves into. Um, we actually did pick the Paul system on the on the right there, and um, the pilots also identified that the membranes have a lower cost per pound to remove than the conventional filter system. Here's a few pictures that I'd like to give you uh, um, give you a little bit of perspective and some time lapse to show you how large this project was. This is just the basement area. You'll see that um, the piping system that we'll have to bring in across the contact basins, which is in the lower section, um, to get the flows to the new facility and then back into the contact basins. This is pretty much just the basement area here. This is when the canisters or the modules themselves were being installed. Um, there are two trains with eight different tra eight racks on each train. Um, there are 4,512 membrane modules. Um, each rack has 282 modules, and the Paul system produces a 96% filtrate and a 4% waste that is recycled back to headworks or back to the digesters. Give you some membrane fun facts. Uh, there's 16 membrane racks, each roughly the size of a semi truck and trailer. Um, there's 6,900 membrane fibers in each module, and they're, uh, every one of them is about six and a half feet long. There's 38,000 miles of membrane fibers there. Um, if you lay them end to end, you're going to circle the earth about one and a half times. Um, and each module, you have five, 538 square feet of filter surfaces. And there's 55 acres total surface areas um, if we were to split these fibers and roll them out flat. Um, we're doing a one-year uh, performance test going on right now. Paul uh, Water Representatives on site full-time. Um, this ensures the performance as specified. Uh, verifies chemicals and energy uses. Uh, we can further optimize the system. Uh, it is also helping enhance the staff training and troubleshooting and assistance. Here's some great meat and potatoes for you. Uh, the, the pipe there on the right is um, uh, showing you the waste after one of the cleaning processes. The dirty color there shown it, um, are the particles that didn't make it through the filters. Here's another one. This is a phosphorus test. The blue color is, is a, the results of the phosphorus reagents. Um, the more intense the blue color, um, 
is directly related to the higher concentration of phosphorus. So that picture there, the blank is of course zero. Um, that is actually the effluent or influent coming into the plant, and that comes in at 550 parts per billion um, coming into the plant. Um, with secondary treatment before the membranes um, is 209 parts per billion, and this is about a 96% reduction from the influent. And then your after membrane uh, is eight parts per, per billion, and this is a 99.8% reduction from influent. Um, this is for for this sample here. The concentration of phosphorus in the influent was about 60, 624 times greater than the concentration after the membrane. And if you compare the blank to the and the after membrane to the naked eye, as you can, you would you need a spectrometer to to get to see it. Um, these pictures here are in, in one of the contact basins, same location. Uh, uh, the one on the left is secondary treatment, so that's what we were putting in last year and what it would have looked like. Um, and the one on the right is after secondary treatment, and it's ran through the membrane facility. You can visually see how much cleaner and clearer the water is. Uh, this is the outfall to the river um, from the plant. March 1st, we started testing and running secondary effluent through the facility during the day. The teams have been going through training to, op um, to operate the system and get proficient and will continue to increase flows through the facility. Um, we will evaluate and ensure we are meeting all permit requirements and if we identify issues or trends, we'll work with ICM and design to find a solution and continue to work for that net environmental benefit. We'd like to bring forward a resolution for the naming of this tertiary facility in Mike Taylor's honor uh, for the work on this project and all the work in the community that he's done throughout the year. This would be the sign that we would like um, to have placed um, on the building. And do you have any questions? Go ahead and Council volunteer. President? Yes. Council Mr. Member Karen. Yes. Bradley and I just have a, a couple comments. Number one, this is a great presentation. And I think that when you're ready, if you work with Council Member Mom and myself, we should get you to present these, this update to our Northwest Neighborhood Councils, especially those that live um, closer to um, the site. I think they would find this fascinating. Mike Taylor used to come. Um, but this is a good update, and also I would totally support the um, the name, the the Taylor name, mm -hmm. in the in the project. Thanks, Councilmember Mum. Yeah, great idea, Councilmember Stratton. Um, they would love to hear about that. Uh, I I think the Taylor naming is certainly appropriate. Mike loved the facility; he was always so proud of it. Um, so so good idea on that. My question is about the uh, wastewater that comes off the in the streets, and you know, I think it, we had a big discussion. Obviously, there's a lot of toxins in there, and, and the, this treatment facility maybe wasn't going to tackle our PCB, some of our PCB issues and that sort of thing. Do you have any update on that? I mean, the, the phosphorus is amazing, but the other types of things that we're struggling with. Uh, we don't have a good. We don't have an update at this point yet. We don't have an, we haven't ran it enough to know what we're going to get. Um, that will come, um, but we just don't have anything at this point yet. We need to run it before full full time. Yeah, that would that would be good to. Yeah, I know once we get there, we'll have better measurements. But I want to share that with our state partners because that was a, you know one of their big concerns as well. But the, I mean, good job. I mean. What we were doing in the past was just not acceptable, and I know this was a huge investment, but a really good one. And I've also talked with downstream cities who have to treat the out of the Columbia River. They that's their sole source is coming out of the river, and so what we do upstream dramatically impacts how much they have to treat, uh, like down in the Tri Cities area. So they were very interested in what we were doing and watching and, and applauding us because they'd like us to send them the cleanest water possible. Yes. Thank you. Council Member Kinnear. Thank you. I too think naming this facility after Mike Taylor is a great idea. He was responsible for saving the city millions of dollars because he right-sized 
these CSO tanks. And not very many people know that. And he was so humble about it, didn't want to talk about it. <clears throat> but I think we need to talk about it and give him all the credit that is due. And um, Raylene, this was a great presentation. So thank you, um, committee, for all your hard work on this. Uh, yes, and, and I want to throw it out there for the team. I, you know, they're, both sides of the house have done a great job um, making all this happen. Um, not seeing anyone else, but if there's another council member, go ahead and volunteer because I'm, I can only see some of you at the moment. Um, okay. Hearing none, uh, Raylene, I also wanted to commend you on the presentation and this work that has been decades in the making. And I'm so happy that we've moved beyond arguing whether we should, uh, reduce our waste going into the river and now gotten into solution mode. So thanks to you and your team. And I also um, endorse the idea of uh, naming the facility after Mike. So go ahead and work with your team on a resolution and you can bring it back to um, a pies committee, which would be the appropriate place for it. So, so thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, that brings us to uh, Marlene is going to talk about every other day watering recommendations and education. Well, good afternoon, Council President, members of the Council. Happy to be here. Um, if you recall, we came and spoke to Council at a study session in early March about our strategic initiative around water stewardship. And one of the things we wanted to bring back to you was um, an idea around every other day watering and encouraging our citizens to take up that watering schedule. Um, so in today's packet, I just have a briefing paper. My, my resolution isn't quite finished yet, but um, our goal here is really it's about education and building uh, this concept in as we provide citizens with education over the summer as part of our WaterWise program. Uh, the Every Other Day Watering Strategy helps us to accomplish multiple goals. Um, one, it's going to be a strategy for our citizens to use to help keep their water costs more affordable. Um, if you recall, we did change how we are going to charge for water use as part of our rate um, discussion last fall. So this is a strategy that our citizens can use to reduce their water consumption over the summer and keep their bills lower. It also um, supports landscape health. So if we um, reduce the number of days we water, we can actually encourage our grass and other plants to grow a, a more robust root system, um, which will help them now, but also will help them when we do get to the hotter, drier part of the summer. And then finally, it helps us reduce that summertime peak usage, which does a couple things for us. Um, one is to protect those resources. Raylene showed you a, a gorgeous picture of the river, so it helps us protect the aquifer and the Spokane River, which of course exchange water. But it also supports our long-term goal as a city to reduce um, capacity improvements in the water system over time. So we're always going to have maintenance. As you know, we had a water main break uh, last night at 17th and Freya. We're going to have those kinds of maintenance issues, but if we can um, get uh, our citizens to adopt a uh, use of less water, we don't have to add as many capacity improvements over time. So this is just part of an education process. Um, Parks has agreed to be an example for the community as well. And in fact, um, Garrett and I are working on an interdepartmental agreement that will help um, continue funding projects for the Parks Department, but also in return, Parks is gonna work with us on how to schedule watering of parks or sections of parks so that we can um, look at uh, parks within a single pressure zone. So we might be able to reduce the needs for you know, keep uh, water consumption down in the pressure zones to help support our citizens as well. Um, and the other things is looking at other strategies around what, you know, what we could do from a parks watering standpoint, for example, when we do hit um, really high uh, heat and summertime usage. There might be strategies that the irrigation specialists can employ in those parks during those times. So, so that's a great um, partnership that we're working on. We'd like to package the water resolution and that interdepartmental agreement together for you to 
for you to review in um, May. But that is basically the, the this issue that I wanted to bring forward today. Any council questions or commentary? Uh, council Member Kinnear. Thank you. Uh, Marlene, I'm wondering if you've had any feedback from citizens about the uh, watering schedule every other day, voluntary, voluntary schedule. We have not yet. We haven't really brought this out to them yet. We're going to do that as part of our education process. This is an encouragement for them to consider. Um, as you know, Lori, if they can start adopting this kind of a schedule now, it's going to be easier for their landscape to handle it. So we, we want to start bringing that out. If if um, you know, the mayor is supportive of, of asking our citizens to adopt this and um, you know on a voluntary basis, and we'd like to start talking about that in our education tools. Well, well I know that um, Jacoby, my assistant, has been out talking to people about water conservation. And that's why I'm asking, because it's out there. People are hearing about it. So that's why I wondered if you were getting any feedback. Even though you guys aren't doing it, we're doing it on our end. Yeah, I have not, um, I have not specific, gotten specific feedback on that council member. Other questions or comments? Yeah, I would just add, um, I think it's, it's really important to emphasize that um, aside from keeping our landscaping um, stronger and keeping our river flowing, just switching to that every other day really reduces the future water rates because those water towers are super expensive to build and the people uh, near Hamblin Park right now have been, you know, in great angst uh, for the last year or so of what it means. And I think the water department's done a great job of showing that when you go to the every other day watering, even just with city parks, it reduces the number of tanks we have to build. So I think that's important. Um, I also think it would be great uh, if we could get a letter from the mayor um, to the community members making this pitch. I'm happy to sign on so that we're doing it side by side uh, so that we everyone knows that we're really all together on this and maybe we put it in one of those uh, com uh, utility billing uh, mailings out there and just let people know it just makes sense and you don't have to sacrifice your yard uh, to save money and keep the river flowing. So. Council President. Council Member Mum. Yeah. I I just wanted to weigh in. I think sometimes when I talk to the neighborhoods about this, there needs to be a little bit of that um, landscape education for folks mm -hmm. about how much water is necessary. And if there was someone who people, um, you know, would, would see as a source of that kind of like, hey, let's save you money and, you know, um, uh, cut back on your watering and you don't need to do it for 45 minutes a zone, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, sort of what the yeah. optimum is. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we have Excellent that capacity. Idea, mm -hmm. Yeah, Nick Hamad um, has kind of volunteered to be a guinea pig for us a little bit, so we, we'll get him on camera talking about those kinds of things. Yep, great. Okay. All right, I think that gets us there. And then next we have a bit of an update on uh, the process of exploring uh, municipal water fluoridation. And this is mainly just a um, super quick high elevation update. We don't have documents today, but essentially um, we were at a, a bit of an impasse because we need to, in order to explore this, uh, we need to do a design, engineering design feasibility uh, study, which was gonna cost money up to $600,000. And the grant agreement that the center uh, that the city entered into with the our Cora Foundation said we would have to pay back that money if we didn't actually add fluoride to the water. And so, um, city staff, council staff, and our Cora staff have been working, and they came up with an agreement in principle that the city would not have to pay back that money uh, if they used it for that uh, feasibility study. And we haven't actually got the language figured out exactly that's going on with the legal team. Uh, but I understand that we do 
uh, we are making some progress on what the request for qualifications on that would be. And I think Marlene, your team was going to talk about what that entailed and yeah. how long that was going to be until that was ready to publish. Great. Yeah. So Elizabeth's here. If you have a specific question on the legal um, amendments that are in, in process and, and Catherine Miller's here to talk about the status on the RFQ. All right. Well, we can start okay. with so I think Council, Council President did a good intro on this. Um, we're still working on the language and crafting the actual amendment um, from a legal perspective. I'm sorry, Marlene, if I interrupted you. Yep. No, you're good. That's great. And regarding the uh, study itself, uh, Steve Burns and I will be the lead uh, folks on creating that RFQ. Already spoken with Council President, uh, his interest to be on the selection committee. Our goal is to obviously have this uh, ready as soon as we can in process. Uh, obviously, that uh, agreement would be in place and then we would be able to uh, get that RFQ out. So, still looking for about a two month process, starting a couple weeks ago, if you will, in terms of just the full process, working through um, uh, our purchasing folks and getting in their queues and all those kind of things. So all that ball is certainly started and, and uh, we'll try to time it with, with everything else going on around it. Okay. Council Member Kinnear. Can you tell us why we need a resolution rather than just um, amending a contract with the CORA? Why are we doing a resolution? Sure. So the mayor and council was a at a bit of an impasse on it, and um, the resolution just states what a lot of us have already said is that uh, by doing the RFQ does not mean that the city is um, going to plunge ahead necessarily without further uh, consideration uh, and public input on it. And so uh, the mayor was looking for a resolution from us, which we we don't have the language yet for that, that would just make it clear that uh, there would be a chance for a mayor and council to talk about the results of the um, study once it was there. And then the city would go in whatever direction it was going. Uh, but the mayor wanted to make sure that she had not changed her mind, that she thinks there should be more public um, input on it. And um, so that was her... Essentially, she wanted an agreement that we would do some language uh, in resolution that would show that. My current idea is we would approve the Arcora contract amendment, approve the award of the contract for the study, and any resolution language on the same meeting a few months from now. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I would just say I'd love to see either a, a advisory or referendum clause on this that says once we finish the the study, that it would go before voters at a at the next the next general or primary election. I, that would make sense, and it'd be the the right time to do it. Yep. Other comments or questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. On to uh, um, oh, this is Karen. Yes, Councilmember Stray. <clears throat> I don't know if this is a. I don't even know how to ask this question, so it may sound really stupid. But what does I mean? As we're talking about this, what does a Cora get out of this if there's no repayment? I mean, why would they do this if there's no repayment? Sure, they. Um, well, Arcora, you know, is a nonprofit foundation committed to public health. Right. And what they want is for the city to fully consider the benefits of, of fluoridation. And they heard that uh, we were kind of stuck on doing the study that we would need to inform us. And so they were willing to say, you know what, we understand you're uh, moving mm -hmm. in that direction and you want that information without financial risk um, to the water rate payers. Uh, until you decide whether you're moving ahead or not. And so that was enough of a win for them. So that, that's why. They, it was basically the city's request, and they agreed because they're, I mean, I, I don't, I, 
probably shouldn't put words in their mouth. So, but they agreed to that. So they would be aware that as we move forward, they would be aware that we're going to be talking about possi the possibility of more public input and how we're going to do that. And if it's going to go on the ballot, I mean, is all of that going to be part of the bigger discussion with them? Yeah, I don't think they are supportive of a ballot measure and sort of turning Spokane into ground zero for fluoride activists on both sides for a year. But they understand that the council and the mayor are going to continue to talk about it. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I just want to make sure that we're transparent with them with what we're yep. Where, what direction we're going. Yep. I, yeah, I had a meeting with them last week and explained what's going on and they've been part of discussions. So, um, council member Kinnear. Just, just one more thing. I, I want us to be really clear that doing a resolution, doing this study isn't a green light for going ahead with implementation because we're already starting to get email from folks saying, thank you for fluoridating our water and going, whoa, we're not doing that. We're doing a study. So I just want to be very clear with the public that this is a study. This is not the green light to go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, any other comments or questions? Yeah, I think the study is a great idea because no matter where a person uh, sits on this, it gets us more information. It'll inform us of what the cost, um, the feasibility of how it would work in Spokane's unique water system. Um, so regardless, pro, anti, pro ballot, anti ballot, whatever you are on it, it should uh, be uh, a win for everybody, which is why I think the mayor um, is moving ahead with this. So. All right, well, thanks, Catherine and team, for doing that. And we'll look forward to hearing back in a couple months. And we'll have a big fluoride night at City Council. I'm sure everyone's excited for that. So. And that brings us to a recycling update. Good afternoon, Council President. Hi, all. Um, it's been about a month, I think, since we, we last uh, spoke, so uh, things are moving rapidly towards uh, the May 3rd, uh, May 3rd kickoff, which is next Monday. Um, to date, uh, we have uh, the maps established, the uh, GIS, uh, the interactive GIS piece on the city website uh, for the user interface has been developed. Uh, I don't know how many have seen the, the Google lookup the uh, search tool, but that's been uh, that's been very um, very well received. Although uh, it was overwhelmed a little bit last week, which is good because uh, people are going to it, um, meaning the communication has been effective to to steer them there. So uh, we're happy with the way that's that's all come together. GIS and and uh, the other uh, departments involved have done a fantastic job of getting that that tool published and and uh, and usable. Um, Postcards have been mailed. Again, that uh, that was pretty uh, strategic as far as getting those into people's hands while the uh, you know, website was was up, running, and functional. So I think, uh, and I don't think we're at the point where we've over communicated, but I, I certainly don't think we've under communicated this uh, with with the tools that are available and the correspondence that that the citizens have received uh, prior to prior to the calendar and routes being developed. Um, currently. Uh, Currently, we're, uh, the tagging piece is occurring for Week B customers as we speak. Uh, week A will happen next week. So, again, that last touch point uh, will, um, you know, should get us to the point where, where we're not overwhelmed from the call center uh, perspective. And, and certainly, hopefully, none of your mailboxes are, are uh, hammered by people that are, are confused and or we haven't done a good job of making them aware of the... The cards have been ordered. The 12,000 cards have been ordered. We'll take receipt of those. The first loads the week of the 17th, and they'll continue to come in through the second week of June while we prepare for that assembly and distribution once uh, once it's known how many people will want the the uh, upgraded or upsized cards. So 
again, the timelines are, are starting to really mesh and, and things are going pretty well from our perspective. Uh, it's a big shift. And, and uh, like I say, there's been just great support and collaboration through throughout the solid waste and public works teams and then, and then beyond with everybody else we needed to intersect to make this a successful transition. Um, and really, that's all I have. We'll kick the routes off in earnest next week. And I'm really looking, for, as an operations guy, I'm looking forward to that because that's when we really get our, our refinement. And uh, so we're excited about it. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Council Member Stratton and then Council Member Wilkerson. Just a quick one, Dustin, because I'm answering emails um, about it now when people, once you explain it to them, they seem to be fine with it. But my question is, if somebody wants a bigger, um, bigger recycling cart, do they pay for that? They do not. I guess the only they, if they go from a, a single 68 or 64 gallon residential service to a 96 gallon residential service, they would not pay for it. If they're currently paying for that second cart at the curb, which is in our rate structure, then yes, they would pay for that second cart, but it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a different different fee than what we're currently paying for that second 64. Okay. Councilmember Wilkerson. So this is for Dustin and Marlene. So if you are a commercial account, will your recycling be every other week or will it still be weekly? I can answer that. So the downtown core in particular for commercial will not be affected because that's picked up at nights. And so those will be a weekly service where we can accommodate a second bin for a commercial customer. We will do it, um, but we do have commercial routes kind of separated now from the residential. So the ability for us to collect weekly on the cart is, is still exists for a commercial cart. Thanks. Other questions? All right. Yeah, I, I'm sure all of us are getting some feedback from people. I like to remind them that we don't currently charge people for picking up recycling and that they can get a bigger cart if they, if they want it. But I'm sure uh, there'll be some feedback starting next, well, probably starting the week after next week, actually, is when it will start. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Thanks. Um, that gets us to a neighborhood cleanup program update. Marlene and Carly. Yeah, Carly's team is feeling the pain on the every other week recycling questions, so uh -huh. we appreciate 311. Um, so we want to talk about the neighborhood cleanup program. Um, we I've sent you actually um, an updated briefing paper just before this meeting started, just to show you where we're at with our thinking. So for 2021, we had recommended limiting cleanup options to disposal passes at the waste to energy plant for the neighborhoods for a number of reasons. Um, one, that we weren't able to do those in-person and, and regular events um, this spring, um, and that um, our employees are now just becoming eligible for vaccines. Um, so the pandemic really did hinder our ability to do neighborhood cleanups last year. And that's kind of where we were, but council has challenged us and our city administrator has challenged us as well to come up with um, sort of a hybrid compromise. So um, we believe, uh, Solid Waste Collections believes we can accommodate as many 16 cleanups from September through the first couple of weeks of November. And that would include nine to 10 curbside pickups and six roll-off container events. Um, the roll-off events could accommodate more than a single neighborhood if the neighborhood were smaller and agreed to a location that was centrally located for more than one neighborhood. So we can get to a little more than half of our neighborhood councils through this proposal. Um, it would require a, a prioritization exercise of sorts um, to select the neighborhoods that would get a roll-off or a curbside event. Um, so um, we're going to be meeting with uh, Carly's team later in the week to kind of go over some of those options. Council also has um, graciously agreed to, to help with um, deciding how to get 
um, those decisions made so that we can move relatively quickly for the other half of the, the neighborhoods that wouldn't get an event like that. We'd still want to make sure that we were efficiently distributing disposal passes so that they could use those at waste to energy throughout the summer for um, an extra load of um, solid waste that they would um, want to bring in. And as you know, the passes um, are going to be usable for a longer period of time than they were last year. Um, the use of the disposal passes we've extended through the end of November so they can be used longer. Um, a digital pass system has been developed to allow residents to have easy access to passes. And of course, we do have printed passes for those who don't have computer or um, smartphone access to get to that digital pass. Um, we want to get going on that promotional campaign, and that's really where Carly's team is in the implementation phase, so we want to be able to get them um, answers as soon as possible. We also had a few dollars saved from 2020, about 11000 We'll retain those and see if we can invest those um, back into the program in 2022 as well. So, Carly, do you have anything to add there? Uh, no, great work. Thanks, Carly. Any questions? Councilor, have you any questions? Um, yeah, so really good news that um, you're open to um, adding the more traditional ones in the fall, even though we can't do everybody, but better to do half than, um, than none. And uh, appreciate how you thought about putting neighborhoods together and doing it together and doing even more than you originally thought. And this is again a good topic when we get to our American Recovery Plan funds of maybe being able to catch up since we did fall behind uh, last year. We weren't able to do that. So super, super happy with that. Thank you. Um, all right. And it looks like, Kyle, you're going to talk about how expensive it is to build new water towers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, they, they indeed are. Uh, so this is in reference to the water reservoir uh, that we need out near the airport, uh, also referred to as the SIA reservoir. Uh, this has been identified as the water system plan as one of our uh, priority reservoirs for the system. So this is not, we're not yet bringing forward the actual construction contract to build this reservoir. This is actually the site acquisition. So we have, we know we need a reservoir in the vicinity of the other tanks that are out there on airport property. And we've looked at several, there's some private property, some DOT property, as well as the airport property to compare. And we've gotten um, uh, cost per square foot information on all of these. The airport property is the least expensive property for us to purchase um, by a good margin actually. Um, the little odd nuance to it is that because the way this property was acquired originally, it was federal surplus military property. Um, so it goes through federal law, which the FAA administers. And so they, they're they making us go through a surplusing process um, at the airport. And so the FAA is requiring us to buy it at market rate. Um, and so that is uh, what is before you right now. Um, they also are um, want us to um, buy the existing reservoir sites. Um, so if you look at the map below, you see we have two reservoirs, a smaller one and a larger one. And then the newest one would go just to the north of those sites. Uh, and the combined for all of that property is $345,000, uh, which is still significantly um, uh, less expensive than some of the other property that we looked at in the vicinity that was also near the appropriate transmission mains and booster stations. So uh, we are bringing this forward so that we can move forward with this property acquisition. All right. Any questions or comments? Councilmember Wilkerson. Kyle, so just clarity. Then will the city then own this property or it's part of the airport property? Who owns the property with this acquisition? The city will actually become the owners of this property for which our reservoir is rest. Any other questions? 
All right. Thanks, Kyle. And uh, Carly, you're next up on uh, updating the Chase Youth Commission contract. Sorry about that. Couldn't find my mute button. Uh, thank you. So for the Chase Youth Commission, we have historically funded them since they broke off from the city uh, at about $45,000 a year. And we have to bring that contract forward annually for approval, which you know requires us to stay on top of remembering to do that uh, and get that filed so accounting is able to uh, pay off the invoices they submit to us. So back in 20, uh, 2019, for the 2020 through 2024 years, we came up with uh, a five-year MOU to reduce the need to keep bringing this forward for council for approval because we believe that the intent was to continue funding them at at least $45,000 a year. Well, in retrospect now, looking at the wording of that contract, it does say that it's subject to funding allocations, which would require us to bring forward an annual contract amendment to be approved, which sort of defeated the purpose. So what we're asking uh, for council to approve is a contract amendment that would um, change that to the, the wording on that um, annual allocation to basically say we will fund them $45,000 a year going forward through the end of 2024. So once you approve that contract amendment, we wouldn't need to bring it forward for council approval every single year. If there was, uh, if you guys decided to award more funding, um, we could do a minor contract because that amount uh, is usually not so much that it needs full council approval. So just a, an effort to streamline the process, make it easier for uh, accounting to be able to process those invoices and get the funding quicker to chase youth uh, and prevent the need for you guys to have to uh, rubber stamp uh, as frequently as you do. Councilmember Wilkerson. I think it's a great program and I'm certainly enjoying my chase youth student this year. But who actually monitors any outcomes, deliverables, benchmarks? Uh, since I've been on council, do they come before us with any type of update of, is the program the same? I would just like, I, I think we deserve some type of update on how the program is progressing or if there's any changes that we could support uh, being made, including additional funding if that's required. Great question, council member. So they do submit um, performance reports uh, to my office. Um, I do believe that they're supposed to be presenting also to council. It's possible with COVID last year that kind of got impacted. I know they'd be more than happy uh, to bring forward and give presentations uh, of what they're working on so you'd be uh, apprised of their deliverables. Uh, underneath the previous administration, uh, Mayor Condon was, was very hands-on with Chase Youth. Um, and so uh, the the, the NBS division at the time processed their invoices and gave them pavement, but we were pretty hands off. Uh, with, with the new administration um, and my move to be with Office of Neighborhood Services, I've asked to kind of be able to step in more and, and work more closely with them um, because it's uh, an interest of mine and I think it would help to get more a youth participation in our neighborhood. So it's on my list of things to do this year um, and hope to be able to uh, attack because I think to your point, they're, they're kind of forgotten. And uh, Susan Nelson is doing great work uh, with them. And I know she's had challenges this last year trying to keep youth engaged over Zoom. Uh, that's a challenge. So I think this is a good opportunity to, to reinvest and, and work towards that. So to, to answer your question, I think there is plenty of opportunity to, to make it more aware of what they're doing. Thanks, Carly. All right. Any other questions for Carly? All right. Thanks, everybody. I think, and I think we've gotten to the end of our agenda, which we usually are over time for this agenda. Uh, but uh, I'm sure next month uh, we'll be close, close to a full meeting. Anyway, if, if there's nothing else for the good of the order, we'll be adjourned uh, until May. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you at 3.30.